Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to you, virtual audience. You have done well to come and follow this round table entitled An Abyss of Plastic Wisdom, a Solutions-Oriented Dialogue. My name is Elise Depneau and I'm the head of international communication of the Sea Cleaners and I will moderate this round table. Uh, we are here to talk about a clean ocean, a horizon that we all share around, around this virtual round table with uh, François Galgani, project manager for Ifremer, France microplastic specialist. Hello. A microplastic researcher, Dr. Tim van Emmerich, assistant professor. Dr. Denise Hardesty, Senior Research Scientist at Zero Oceans and Atmosphere Australia for the Science Policy Interface. A citizen, well, our citizen scientist Bargavi uh, will, come, will arrive soon in 30 minutes when she has her uh, power back. Uh, so we also have a policymaker here, Elena Petrikovikova de Chevilly, Policy Officer for the Marine Leader at the European Commission in Brussels. To talk about remote sensing, we are here with Dr. Marc Lucas, Senior Sonographer and Project Manager at CLS Group in France. We also welcome the representative of an NGO, Kevin Hendojo, Team Leader for Bye Bye Plastic Bags in Surabaya, Indonesia. We also host Luc de Souter, Sense Sustainability Officer at CIDL, provider of equipment, services, and solutions for packaging liquids foods, home, and personal care products. Humi Ahmed Mikidash, journalist, founder, and director of ERA Environment, a media based in the Comoros. And Gwen Alcoat, the Sea Cleaner Scientific Director. Thank you very much, Gwen, for putting together this wonderful panel. So before giving you the floor, I think it's useful to recall quickly some essential data on the current state of plastic pollution in our oceans. Plastic are a marker of the current geological era, the Anthropocene. They have even given their name to a new microbial habitat known as the plastisphere. Increased awareness of the negative impacts of microplastics on marine ecosystems and human health has led them to be referred to as a type of oceans PM 2.5, akin to air pollution. The most urgent issues now to be addressed are how to reduce the volume of uncontrolled or mismanaged waste streams going into the oceans and how to increase the level of recycling. The economic cost of marine plastic pollution in terms of its impact on tourism, fisheries and aquaculture, degradation of ecosystem goods and services and even cleanup costs are significantly underestimated. So we need urgent action now. Today, with this beautiful panel, we are going to talk about environment, health, economic and social impacts, sources and pathways of plastic pollution marine litter, monitoring methods and citizen science, and last but not least, the current industrial, social and governance landscape relating to marine litter and plastic pollution, innovations and actions. So let's start with the environmental, health, economic and social impacts with Kevin. Uh, to talk about the urgency of acting to protect and restore our oceans. Kevin, I think you have a question, you have the floor. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Elise, for the time. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kevin, as the team leader of Bye Bye Plastic Bags for Abaya. Yes, uh, this uh, topic about environmental health, economic and social impact really interested me. Some people are aware that the plastic or single-use items are definitely harmful for the environment, as we all know, but they might not understand the urgency of the whole issue. You know, they might acknowledge that plastic cannot biodegrade easily and it's harmful for the long run. Some don't even know the harms of plastic or single-use items to the environment itself. So I wanted to ask actually to Denise, uh, what is the best way to kind of describe the issue to these people who haven't uh, really been aware of the whole issue and what are the things we shouldn't forget to put into consideration? That's a really good question, Kevin, and I suppose my answer is a little bit multifold. And I suppose to me, I try to think about what matters 
to the person that I'm speaking with. So some people actually really care about the environmental impact. So if you talk about work that says that plastic is causing harm to seabirds or turtles or whales or dolphins, that may really resonate with someone. Um, with somebody else, that may they may not care and that may not be of interest. And so I really try to make sure that I target my message in a factual, accurate way, and also in a way that perhaps will resonate with people. So some people are much more focused on business. And we know that there are economic costs and consequences of having dirty beaches and dirty areas. We know that people will travel further to spend their money in places that are cleaner. We also know that people tend to litter or we see more trash in places where people are transient. And so I really try to think about what is actually going to be appropriate and relevant for the audience member. So if I'm in an area that's really monsoonal, I may mention the fact that plastic bags, for example, they block our stormwater drains, result in flooding, and that has human health consequences. I may also mention that Yes, we are finding plastics or microplastics in everything from our table salt to our drinking water. But I also try to really remind or to ask people to reflect on solutions and understanding for what's going to be socially, culturally, economically, and environmentally relevant where they are. So I don't find it particularly useful if somebody from the United States or Australia talks to people about we should not have single-use plastic water bottles to someone who's in a country where they do not have clean drinking water, for example. And so I think it's really important to make sure that we're looking at place-based, socially and culturally appropriate solutions and that we're talking about things in ways that are appropriate and relevant to our audience. So when I'm in Liberia and there are plastic bags that water is sold in, you know, I want to work with the communities and the entrepreneurs there that are looking at capturing rainwater into tanks and that we're addressing plastic pollution from a clean drinking water perspective, for example. And so, again, whether you have an environmental focus, whether you have an economic focus or a political focus, I think this is a topic that's really relevant to each and every one of us. And I also try to remind people that people are really powerful as consumers, as purchasers, and that we have the opportunity to have a lot of influence with our purchasing power and within our communities and groups. So I realize I could talk forever on this stuff, but I will go ahead and pause there. Thank you. Do you want to add something? Anyone? Kevin? Oh, you're on mute. OK, uh, thank you so much. I think it's already well explained. I really love the answer and definitely agree with you on you know, the importance of relevancy and addressing the whole issue. Well, um, I, I can uh, add something, Elise, of if course. you'd like. Yeah, yeah of yeah. course, Tim. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Tim van Emmerich here from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, maybe to quickly elaborate on, um, on what you said um, and what Denise said. Um, so I, I think there's maybe three ways that we're trying to explore in terms of creating awareness uh, while doing science or create impact with our science. One of them is actually the way that we do science. So here in the Netherlands, we're very much working together with all kinds of citizen science initiatives to collect data on river plastics in the Dutch rivers. So there's, there's hundreds, I think nowadays even more than a thousand volunteers doing the monitoring together with us um, on a national level. So that means that a thousand people are collecting data, collecting images, collecting anecdotal evidence of the impact of plastics in our own rivers. Um, and besides that the, the we can use that for our scientific purposes, um, we also see a sort of snowballing effect on social media, uh, in, in mainstream media, um, that really exploits all of these uh, anecdotes and, and scientific evidence of the impact of plastics in, in this case, Dutch rivers. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is that for me, it's very important to put things into perspective. Um, I guess one of the, let's say, um, 
well, positive things of the pandemic is that my research team was not able to do our research in other places, uh, which led to a lot of new projects closer to home in the Dutch rivers, in the European rivers. Um, and that is extremely necessary because I think a lot of people, especially here, they tend to think that plastic is mainly a problem either in the open oceans or in places that are far away from here, right? Um, but luckily, we now have the data to show that it's not at all the case. So for those who are maybe not familiar with the, with the Dutch rivers, last July, we had a major flooding in the River Meuse uh, that really had devastating effects on Germany, Belgium, parts of the Netherlands. Um, of course, there was unfortunately a lot of casualties and damage, but there was also a huge additional mobilization of plastic pollution through the River Meuse. We were able to measure and demonstrate that the amount of plastic that we measured in the Meuse in the Netherlands was the largest or the second largest amount of plastic ever measured by our team in the world. And showing that now this river Meuse ranks similar in ter terms of order of magnitude as rivers in the Philippines or Indonesia or Vietnam, showing that and communicating that very clearly, uh, we see that that contribute so much to the awareness of the fact that also here rivers are not clean and action should be taken in the end. Um, yeah, some thoughts from my side. Uh, so it, it's too bad that Bargavi is not uh, here yet to talk about citizen science, but uh, we talk about uh, citizen science a bit later. Um, uh, to uh, refer back to what you were uh, saying, Denise, you were talking about cultural differences to take in account. Um, so I think, Francois, you had a question about that because uh, marine litter and uh, plastics are threat multipliers. So, so we have seen that. Um, so indeed, the threat will be perceived differently from one community to uh, another. Francois? Uh, yes, I do have a question, in fact. I realize that, I mean, the perception we have of marine litter is completely different, depending on the, I mean, different thing. Uh, I mean, if, if it's uh, if it has an impact on human, for instance, the perception will be higher by the general public. Uh, when it's the environment, I suppose that uh, uh, specialists and environmental NGOs and so on will be uh, more concerned, I would say. And so, I mean, the question I, I, I ask is uh, uh, why we do have a, a different perception and how we can uh, find a consensus around it to, to all per se that there is a, an issue anywhere. And my question could be to uh, uh, Alena or Umi, maybe? I, I can uh, I can <laughs> reply uh, if, uh, if uh, whom we, uh, uh, I don't think she's there. Uh, as uh, we were also saying at the beginning, I think that uh, everyone uh, finally knows today that uh, uh, we have too much plastic in the sea and that uh, marine plastic pollution is a problem. And uh, we have uh, we have had a lot of uh, photographs and social media and uh, studies uh, that are saying this, but. Uh, uh, I think that this public indignation was uh, was very important to create the impetus to, to, to do something, uh, not only at our policy level, but also at the citizens level, and take actions in our everyday lives. But for example, when we were working on, um, on our legislation, we have seen that uh, there were, for example, times where um, fishermen were those that were pointed, uh, pointed out as the ones that are polluting the sea, because they are uh, supposedly throwing out their nets and... Uh, and um, and all the trash in the sea, and uh, and I don't think that uh, that this um, this is fair uh, also because uh, you know the fishermen are also the ones that are the for forefront of uh, of the battle, and uh, they have known uh, the problem for a very very long time. Uh, they have been paying the cost of the pollution also themselves, uh, and they are also bringing back litter. And uh, thanks to our legislation that we have put in place, uh, uh, they know that if they bring back their litter and their fishing nets and back to shore, they know that it will be dealt with properly. And we have also seen, for example, uh, when we were introducing some restrictive measures, that this was not something very pleasant for the businesses or, or, uh, or for the industries. But um, I think that no matter how we are looking at this, Everyone has to take, uh, start taking uh, responsibilities for the environmental impact. We are uh, the materials we are using are having on our uh, on our environment, on our seas, on our oceans. So, whichever uh, activity we are looking at, 
uh, um, there is simply no zero cost solution to reducing plastic waste. And, uh, and then, um, uh, so even though the perception of the plastic pollution and the contribution may differ between different communities, we all need to act together. We have a common goal uh, and to truly contribute to the reduction and prevention of the plastic uh, pollution in our seas and ocean, we need to continue raising awareness between, uh, between the public. We have to continue demanding contributions from the producers uh, that are that are producing uh, those uh, plastic uh, items and materials. We also have to promote the circular designs uh, that are more environmentally friendly also uh, and, uh, and the manufacturers. And uh, also, of course, as, as we said at the beginning, to, to look at the, at the circularity. Uh, so uh, we need to use, uh, reuse uh, uh, and recycle the products uh, that, uh, of our everyday life, uh, the plastic products, and so on, then you know, to deal with uh, a proper end of life uh, waste management. So, yeah, I could, <laughs> I could continue on this a lot. But I think, yes, that the perception and the contribution really differ between the communities. And I just wanted to show you the two examples on how fishermen would be one of the communities that would be pointed uh, fingers on uh, and, uh, and uh, how, how the businesses would react uh, to, uh, to other measures. But yeah, we all need to act together. So okay. Holly wanted to jump into the conversation, but I think uh, Mark had uh, just some comments to, uh, uh, to complete the previous uh, intervention. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, it, uh, so Mark Lucas from from CLS uh, in France. Um, well, actually, it kind of uh, follows quite well from what um, uh, Alena has just said. But um, I think it is, uh, and actually, and I wanted actually to kind of uh, um, follow up on what Tim was saying was, you know, the importance actually of uh, maybe uh, the develop developing world of kind of you know finding the solutions and not just kind of you know uh, <laughs> thinking that it's kind of a for uh, a problem that's kind of you know in 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 a sorry uh, you know. Um, Developed world finding the solutions, and it's not just a problem in developing countries. And uh, in particularly, you know, when we come to the issue of, of fishing, you know, uh, one of the things that is probably very important to do is to start tagging fishing equipment so that when it's lost, you can kind of find it more easily. And uh, and you know, this is something we are currently working on here. Uh, but I think it's something that you know we can start putting in place uh, in uh, countries which have the, the finances, which can probably uh, fund the development, and then try and find solutions which are adaptable to developing countries and. Uh, yeah, so I guess, you know, this follows probably a bit off on what Tim was saying on, you know, the importance of not just thinking, oh, it's, you know, it's a it's a problem that's kind of far away, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, I think we have a, the, the plastic problem is global and it's and it actually started probably in in our countries. And so I think we have a probably a responsibility to find the solutions, be there technological, be there also, um, you know, in terms of legislative and, you know, and find alternatives also uh, at the moment, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, reducing plastic, but there's lots of alternative materials that we can use that are more uh, environmentally friendly that should be part of our everyday lives and not, you know, uh, yeah. So I guess, you know, that's my, uh, my my short comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Humi, uh, you wanted to add uh, something about the conflictual side or, or I can't see you. I can't hear you either. Can you see me? No. I, I think I think Denise may have. Okay. Uh, okay. May have. Oh, sorry. You can see me now. Okay. We can hear you. You can hear me. That's fine. Um, good morning. Um, related to the communities, I think that you you don't have to you you have to. Um, take into account also the informal sector. Um, there are many people who are working on recycling um, plastic waste management, but it is informal in Africa. And uh, related to the fishermen, they, are not, they don't care actually, in Comoros Islands, they don't care of the plastics actually. They are selling, they are walking with the plastic and people are eating the fish. And I think that uh, what is very important is to set up a legal framework. And that will be the key to involve all the stakeholders and also the private sectors, because the private sector is uh, one of the key players in this field. And uh, if you look at um, in Africa, I've just interviewed um, the representative of UNECA on climate change, and you are saying that there are two key um, 
there are two main jobs that can be uh, important for the for the use and for the for Africa. It's renewable energy and smart agricultures. Renewable energy for um, for for plant for for the sea could be interesting. So I think the most important is to see how the government can involve all these stakeholders with this legal from framework. Uh, Elena, yes. I would like to just uh, come on this uh, back uh, because on the legal framework, this is something in the, at the at the EU level we have uh, we have been doing. Uh, we have uh, an example I can give you uh, quite an important legislation on a single plastic and fishing gear, where when we were developing it, uh, we were uh, involving um, uh, not only member states who are the ones that is directed to, but also all the other communities. We have been closely working with the fishermen uh, as, uh, as, the, as the fourth one, with the industry, with the recyclers, with the ports who are receiving the waste from the sea, uh, with the local authorities, with the, uh, with, uh, the different, yeah, different waste managers. So all of the communities, they, they have to come together and, uh, and then <clears throat> implement those actions because we have put in place a number of measures. Uh, but uh, if you don't connect all of these communities, uh, it, it, it just won't work in practice. So uh, this is something under our legal framework that uh, we have uh, we have put together. The measures uh, that are in would involve great cooperation and collaboration between between all of these communities. So this would to be a success. And um, and now we are in the phase of implementing, and we are actually looking at it at a practical way because you cannot just uh, come up with a legislation and legislative action and then uh, make, make it happen. Huh? So uh, we accompany really uh, all of these uh, stakeholders uh, and we, we put them together at one table so that they talk to each other because this is also something that was not really happening at some point. So I think this this is the important part after the policy making is really uh, to, to accompany the implementation of the measures on the spot. Thank you, Alina. Mark? Yeah, thank you. J just a quick comment. Um, we talk about, you know, the legal framework and, you know, and uh, how to impact the private sector. But one of the reason plastic is so so common is because it's so cheap. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, the current alternatives are a little bit more expensive, you know, uh, and I, um, it, I, it strucks me that, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we're asking a lot from the citizens and, you know, and people are getting, you know, um, Oh, oh, you know, they're, they're, we're raising awareness about, you know, the, the, the potential um, impact of plastic, but um, as long as plastic remains dirt cheap, uh, it's, it's a bit what we've seen for, um, for oil and gas, you know, as long as it's dirt cheap, you know, um, it's the go-to solution. And so, you know, maybe there's some effort to be done on, on this side. Well, um, uh, about solutions and uh, uh, plastics, Bargavi wanted to talk about bioplastics. Um, anyone has a comment about bioplastics? Maybe Francois, bio-based plastics are polymers that are either biosourced, biodegradable, biodegradable or both. Uh, so, um, yeah. Francois, you have, yes. Yes, I think we, we must, I mean, make the difference between biosourced and, and bioplastics because biosourced could be the same plastic that any kind of plastic from uh, the fuel and so on. So, uh, I think that uh, plastic is interesting because it's light and resistant. And uh, plastic is a problem because it's light and resistant. So where we find some way to solve the questions, then uh, the equation, I think that that would be helpful, I would say. And uh, bioplastics, not biosourced, but maybe interesting in some case, uh, because uh, uh, especially, I would say, when resistance is not really necessary, uh, but it cannot be used, for instance, for composite, you know, rings of planes, for instance, that are lowering the carbon emissions are very interesting. And for, I mean, polymer sciences, I mean, there is a future there. But I mean, in terms of uh, end of life for some plastic, it's not really the case. So, uh, so I think that uh, for um, uh, markets, for instance, uh, fruits, vegetables and so on, the use of bioplastics is really interesting. There is a, a place, there is a, um, I would say, a market for them. And uh, it must be supported, I would say, but it, it cannot be used for in any case. And then about the degradability, I would say that it depends on the material and it may be better than classical polymers, but I mean, uh, uh, it may not work because uh, I mean, the natural conditions are so that, I mean, not really degrade uh, most of the uh, bioplastics, I would say. 
So uh, bioplastic, I mean, there is a place for bioplastics, but the market will not be uh, as for any plastic. Denise? Sure. So I might just touch on a couple of different points as our conversation has been going. Francois, I agree with you regarding bioplastics. I'm also, I think it's very important for us to be mindful of unintended consequences of bioplastics and are we going to grow food for the world or are we going to grow packaging material for the world? And I think some of those things are important for us to consider. You also raised a point earlier, Francois, asking, will there be a consensus around the importance of plastic? And I, I think the, the honest answer is no, yeah. you know, um, and I also think that's okay because people and countries have different weights of focus. You know, if I was in um, Kiribati, I would be more concerned about sea level rise right now than about the plastics that are arising on my shore, you know, and, and our political frameworks are being really shifted by pandemics and, you know, global issues that are, they're coming fast and furious, global supply chain issues, you know, that we're seeing in light of the pandemic and those sorts of things. You know, there's also been a couple of points. So Tim raised earlier, he mentioned the impacts of plastics in rivers based upon their local research. And I would absolutely say that, yes, most of the plastics that we find in various countries around the world are local in origin, particularly around our urban centers. But I would also encourage us to not mistake presence for impact because we can show that there is plastic in an area and you know a comment was raised earlier as well there's plastic in fish but we as humans don't tend to consume the entire fish unless it's anchovies or fry or things like that and so when we remove the digestive tracts we tend to remove the plastics and so I would be personally much more concerned about heavy metal contaminants in fish from urban centers than I would be about microplastics in fish. So I think, you know, when we talk about consensus, when we talk about some of these topics, the more information that we have and that we're able to share that is accurate and not sensationalized, you know, perhaps we can help to ensure as research scientists, as advocates, et cetera, that we are using appropriate, accurate information to help inform those policies, the decision-making that's maybe happening at the grassroots level, maybe happening at the, you know, at the, at the international versus, versus the local scale. So I think there are some real roles um, that we can each play in with our expertise, with our styles of communication that hopefully can help to address the issue and the issue will not be of equal importance. So while I appreciate that it would be great if everyone had a focus on plastic pollution, if you do not have food on your table at night, you know, you may be focused on other issues rather than is there litter on the corner of the street or in the waterway. And I think it's really important for us to contextualize from our very privileged places that we are all joined in this meeting from. Like we all have computers, we have power, we have electricity, we have the knowledge to and the privilege to even focus on this topic. And so let us not stand in judgment um, let us be inclusive and supportive, I would say. Not that anyone is being anything other than that, but I just think it's a good check for all of us, given that I don't think we're dialing in from places with dirt floors and no electricity. So, you know, I think it's good to be mindful and to contextualize within a more global framework. And as was raised earlier, the really important contribution of the informal sector in terms of waste management and plastics is a social justice it is a social equity issue and i think that framing may be a useful context for us to consider as well and i'll stop with my soapbox thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you denise um i just wanted to uh, ask you luke to to have, I wanted to have your opinion about bioplastics and and just um, after that I would like to ask Humi um, I think she wanted to intervene about waste management and jobs in uh, in waste management so uh, Luke um, about bioplastics please 
Well, um, actually, on, on bioplastics, and I, I think, uh, François, you did uh, uh, introduce it uh, very well, because uh, what is bioplastics? Is this biodegradable? Is this uh, just uh, biosourced? Uh, there's quite a difference, and, and we need to distinguish that. Uh, nowadays, just to give you an idea, uh, when we produce uh, worldwide something like uh, 400 and so million tons of plastics altogether, uh, we have about 2 million tons of bioplastics uh, uh, altogether. And some of them are uh, polyethylene produced, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in Brazil and uh, in competition, uh, of course, with agriculture, uh, with some, uh, let's say, uh, issues, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, land use, uh, for, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, between the, the use of packaging material or uh, food generation or other things. So uh, there's always a, a big question about, uh, about that. And there are different ways, by the way, of producing uh, um, uh, bio-based or biosourced polymers. You can have it from plants, from animals, from plants. The way, very well-known is rubber, uh, the rubber tree. Uh, uh, we, we have this for our tires. Uh, that, that's the only formulation, by the way, that works uh, for, for, for tires the, uh, uh, to, to get the, the good formulation. Uh, there are, um, let's say, bio-derived de uh, monomers. Uh, you can uh, start from sugar, from many different uh, chemical reactions. And you have also microorganisms, which is a quite interesting one, actually, because this is something you can create, generate new materials. And this is probably one of the, uh, the ways of the future um, some have looked at uh, algae to, to produce the polymers. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, it, it's very new. It's, it's not something uh, uh, really available today, but they, I think with science, uh, we, we can uh, do a lot of things uh, and solve all these problems. We are looking at materials like PHA, PHBs, uh, that, that looks pretty interesting, but it's today it's peanuts. So it, it, there's quite uh, a timing between the development of these polymers and their, uh, their reach of the market. And there's also uh, one very important item that we have to have in mind is a recyclability. Because if we do the same thing with biopolymers as we do today, uh, we, we, lose, we are losing the point. Uh, we have to have a way to recycle it, either through a, a proper biodegradation, a controlled one, not leaving the nature, mother nature to do it, but having the right composter, the right uh, let's say, outlets uh, of, of these materials to uh, either produce energy or to go back to, uh, to the resin, uh, to, to the polymer itself, uh, and to, um, uh, well, to, to have useful products and not uh, let uh, nature do that, because if we leave biodegradation, we generate either methane or uh, carbon dioxide, it depends on, on the weight control. But uh, what I can tell you as well coming from the private sector is that we don't neglect at all uh, those elements. What is missing is availability, uh, is maybe some uh, further efforts, although you will see that a lot of uh, industries are financing uh, research on this. Uh, it, it's, um, um, it, it's a reality. So yes, we have to look at these solutions and we are looking at these solutions. Thank you, Thank you Francois. Yes, thank you. I fully support, I mean, what has been said. Uh, I just would like to say that, I mean, new materials will be really helpful in the future. We gave six Nobel Prizes to uh, inventors of polymers in the past, and they didn't realize, I mean, the impact it could have uh, been in the future. But, I mean, uh, I heard about uh, an American team uh, working on the, the recyclability of plastics, for instance. They are binding polymers, classical polymers, polyethylene, polypropylene, and so on. Uh, with specific uh, regions that may be precipitated and enabling the recycling thousands of times of the different matrices. And so it doesn't pass through the industrial constraints or not, but technically we do have some hope there. And uh, improving recyclability means that it will give value to any plastic in the environment. And just for that reason, because this is probably the key element, if we find a value, it's like human, you see, and end of life is really a problem. And uh, if we find a new value for the plastic in the environment, and I think that we solve largely part of the problem. Thank you. Well, uh, regarding the value of plastic, um, Humi, you, you had a question, I think, about uh, uh, the jobs related to marine waste management. Yes, um, I, I think, and also is a question to the private sector. 
We are talking about the private sector from the West. And in Africa, for instance, people are working also in formal sector. There are companies in Africa on recycling. How do you involve these people in, in the job and how in the job story? And how do you, um, do you think you will involve the youth in this green job and give this, this blue job, sorry? between informal and formal. I mean, there are companies, formal companies uh, who are working on recycling, but there are also informal companies. And you are, uh, you, you, you actually just mentioned, Sida, uh, you are, at, actually you have 30 countries, um, 30 offices in, in Africa where you involve uh, your, your, your activities. I mean, today there are people also who are uh, investing uh, in 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 um, in this field, how do you involve them? Well, we we, we do uh, uh, first of all uh, work on uh, recyclability of the solutions we we provide. That's a very important uh, element. Um, secondly, we we are not directly, but we are investing in this uh, area of uh, recycling technologies. So uh, I will not tell you the world is perfect because it is not. And uh, are we perfect? We are not. Uh, we have a, a lot of things to do. Uh, but I think we, uh, we we do that essentially with uh, with partnerships uh, wherever we can. And I can tell you that uh, you know uh, we 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 do uh, we do have from our uh, customers from our uh, key accounts uh, the big names, uh, but also smaller names. I mean, uh, we are not only working for Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, or Nestle, Danone, whatever, but there are many uh, small uh, players who are really concerned about, um, and more and more concerned and committed uh, to, um, uh, to recycle and to use recycled material in their products. Um, I don't have full details about what we are doing uh, in Africa, um, I think in South Africa, it's probably uh, more uh, organized today uh, with also refillable uh, applications, for instance. In the rest of Africa, I think there is a, it's open to uh, a lot of things today uh, and we have to, uh, not only us, uh, because uh, the, we, we cannot do everything, but um, uh, this is an area where we need to work, definitely. And, and I, 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 I get your point. Uh, uh when when you said that there is a big difference between geographies and for sure we see that uh i can take an example of uh, china for instance uh, and i've been very often to china and uh, not so long ago uh, i mean before 2018 as you know uh china was the uh, uh the, the, the bean of uh uh, of the old world, uh, everyone sending plastics over there, uh, but not only uh, uh, paper and everything, and they stopped that. Well, you know that uh, it has moved to other countries. We know that very well to Thailand, to other places. But also what we see is that uh, China has put in place uh, back uh, in 2019 uh, some uh, selective uh, collection of plastics, uh, of packaging. And uh, I can see uh, things moving when actually uh, legislation is moving. And you cannot imagine uh, how much the uh, European uh, single-use plastics uh, has uh, generated uh, in uh, countries like China. I had very often questions, ah, what are you doing in, uh, in Europe? How is it going to do? Japanese customers asking for that. It, customers from all around the place uh, looking at Europe uh, as the, uh, the the lighthouse of uh, let's say uh, what we can do in managing waste uh, i'm not saying it's perfect that uh, we give lessons to the rest of the world because situations as you know are very different uh, because of infrastructure because of culture because of a number of things but uh, I, I think one of the solution is not only the private sector on its own it's private sector plus uh, of course uh, uh, the legislator uh, plus, uh, of course, uh, information towards consumer. And if consumer has no solution else than littering, uh, we have a big issue. If he has alternative solutions, uh, then we, we can start to make progress. 
Thank you, Luke. Uh, Kevin, you want to add something? And then uh, someone from the virtual audience, Thierry Bureau, had uh, also a question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, it's already well explained on you know what Luke has said before, but I just really want to quickly touch on the youth side because I noticed what uh, your your question has you know how can youths be involved in it? And although uh, as a youth myself, I'm probably the youngest here and the least experienced, but uh, working in the environmental sector and you know fighting for people to say no to plastic bags and all that. Uh, what we see is we cannot really get too much involved in the whole recycling industry, but we what we can be involved is to in the prevention side. So recycling, as what I've been taught, and you know what us in bioplastics have believed is to be the last step of waste management. Recycling should be the last step, and the first step is that is to actually prevent. Uh, these ways to be created in the first place. So that's why we uh, encourage more youths to kind of, you know, create that social impact to have that impact on making people uh, pr uh, prevent on you... making such ways. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is my uh, voice clear? Is my voice audible? Yes. All right. All right. Yeah. Just like what I said before, you know, we can't really get too much involved in the recycling industry, but what we can do is to push other people to prevent these waste from uh, being produced in the first place. Thank you. It, it looks like uh, Elise is frozen, so um, you have had some uh, comments, Elena. Thank you very much. I just wanted to come uh, up on uh, what Kevin was saying about the about the young uh, young generation and young people getting involved, uh, because I just wanted to to share that at the EU level we have uh, we have an ocean literacy initiative actually it's it's called the EU for Ocean, and we involve actually young children from elementary schools until but even from kindergarten actually until uh, um, yeah from elementary and uh, and primary schools. So that they have educational activities and um, so that they can understand and uh, appreciate the ocean, for example, and um, and, uh, and and different impact that, that uh, our our life choices can can have it on them. So I think that's also uh, it can complement uh, what uh, what Kevin was saying because I think that if we in, in uh, include kids from the very young age and uh, and and actually through their teachers that could inspire them uh, and to, you know, to challenge them. Um, it, yeah, they, they will have a better understanding and knowledge of, uh, of, uh, of the impacts we can have uh, in, in our choices huh, in their life. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, Thierry, we don't have your question yet, but Isabel wanted to add something. Oh, Thierry, okay. So Isabel first, sorry. Um, so <laughs> I, I barely can read. Um, so she said, I think also that the politics bodies, the different services of management in local collectivities have a huge responsibility to show the example and better manage the, the light, later issue. They have to be well informed and must be integrated into the reflection. They must survey what kind of economical activities are developed in territories. What is entering as product to be sold will, to be sold will becoming a waste at a time. Uh, so Isabelle Poitou is from Merter, Merter in France. Um, so Thierry Bureau from Dubai have a question. Has a question. So what do you think about the rewarding solutions like the Loop mobile app, for example? which in emerging countries could be a way to convince people not to throw plastic in the nature. Recycling action is rewarded and can be converted to goods and services locally in the country. Oh, and Bhargavi is here. Welcome, Bhargavi. And time's running out, so please be short, because uh, we have to talk about source and pathways of marine nature and plastic pollution and other topics. <laughs> uh, Denise? I think very briefly, I think the point about incentives is really important. If we put a price on plastics, you can call it a tax, a levy, a fee, call it what you want. When we treat plastic as a commodity rather than as waste, 
it will cease to be lost into the environment. We see this happen over and over again. We know that incentives work, and we know that actually a very small amount of financial reward or incentive can be incredibly effective, whether you, no matter what your country is, where you are around the world. So I think if we put a price on plastic and valorize it, we will fundamentally change the game. And there is absolutely no silver bullet, but that is the closest thing to a framing to really shift um, shift the dial on our relationship with plastics. So to that question or comment that came before, I absolutely think once we value plastic, um, we'll start to harness the energy that comes from it and we will start to design with a long-term perspective so that we are treating products as a valued commodity rather than a cheap product that has these externalities that result in it being lost into the environment. Thanks. Thank you, Denise. Oh, Luke? Yes, one, one quick comment, and I, I fully agree that uh, there's value. I mean, we are talking about materials that should not be considered as waste, but as a valuable material. Uh, for instance, nowadays, uh, with the high demand uh, generated on uh, uh, on PT, you know, that's the uh, typical uh, plastic used on, on bottles. Uh, the, the price of a, of a bale, or of a one ton bale, is, is huge. Uh, it's uh, several hundreds, uh, uh, hundred uh, euros. Uh, it's fluctuating, but th there's a real value. And by the way, the price of uh, recycled PT uh, is, uh, has reached nearly twice the price of uh, the virgin one. And uh, brand owners, uh, they pay for that value. They pay because they do understand that consumer no longer accepts uh, plastics unless it's recycled. And, and th there's quite a big move in there. There's still a lot of work to do. If you read, uh, uh, I didn't have time to, to fully read the, the, the report from uh, the global commitment from Ellen MacArthur, but uh, they are monitoring the progress uh, in uh, uh, on a yearly basis of all the commitments made by the big brands. It's uh, it's never enough, but uh, it, it's uh, it's a move that has started. Thank you, Denise. Sorry, I just need to put my hand down. Somebody else should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, so let's move on to the next topic: uh, sources and pathways of marine litter and plastic pollution. I think Gwen, you wanted to start with this one. Sure. So I have a question to both uh, for both uh, Tim and Denise, actually. And um, so we, we talked about so many things already uh, starting, you know, uh, starting from single use plastics to what to do about it, uh, citizen science, research, um, uh, monitoring a little bit and uh, and circular design and everything. And uh, of course, of the legal framework and um, a lot of um, what is important is uh, the, um, the science-based evidence to be able to uh, influence policy making and so to be able to influence policy making we need to understand uh, the issue at hand and um, there's a lot of research uh, on rivers and uh, um, pathways sources watershed uh, um, and we all know that at First, uh, the plastics comes from is majoritarily is land based. The issue is land based. So, how do we um, do the research to understand where the plastic is coming from? How and how do you um, put um, the um, the results together so that uh, we can all understand uh, where it's coming from and what are the differences? Uh, uh, on, on the comp composition of plastics from the river, on the beach, why? So that's a huge topic, but just to, so that we all understand a little bit of where's the plastic coming from and how can we uh, manage locally those that plastic as we talked about. Thanks, Gwen. Yeah, I think this is a, a great question or a set of questions. Um, but I, I yeah, I, I think the a complete answer will probably last uh, several hours or or <laughs> maybe years before we uh, have a satisfactory answer. Okay, but I can make a start it. maybe. <laughs> yeah. So maybe um, I'm I'm not sure about everyone's background, but I'm a hydrologist by training. So I actually I don't know much about the ocean. For me, like I really have a lot of experience on river systems and also macroplastics in river systems themselves. So for me, sort of the assessment stop 
when the plastics uh, leave the river systems, the estuaries into the ocean. But when we look at river systems, um, I mean, if we ask ourselves the questions, where is the plastic coming from? It's coming from people, right? So it's an anthropogenic uh, material. Uh, it's used by people. So it's 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 the people who are, I would say, the, the main mechanisms of um, uh, inserting plastics into the ocean. Now, of course, the exact mechanisms, they are still, they can vary greatly. Uh, I mean, there is a sort of unintended leakage from infrastructure. Uh, there is uh, direct littering by individuals. There is leakage from industries. There is leakage from certain activities. Um, there is unforeseen mobilization mechanisms uh, caused by, for example, extreme events. So um, and with that, I mean like um, um, cyclones or tsunamis or, or floods, like even if your waste management infrastructure is not leaking anything, if you have a ma major flood like we had here or um, recently uh, Hurricane Ida in, in the US, there will be stuff mobilized, unfortunately. Um, then, of course, once it enters the river system or, or, or a catchment, the question is, OK, how does it then travel through the environment? How does it travel through a river system itself? And I have to say, we still work on the hypothesis that the main mechanisms for transport are hydrometeorological variables. So, for example, wind, speed and direction, uh, surface runoff, uh, maybe river flow and discharge. Um, maybe um, flow through urban drainage systems we still don't know so if you have to ask if i have to answer the question what is the effect of wind on plastic transport my question would first be or my answer would first be i don't know and if i would know a little bit it very strongly depends because it depends on the type of plastic that you're looking at it depends on the type of environment that you that you have it it, it determines or it depends on uh, sort of the resisting influences in the in the landscape um, and and that altogether determines whether or not a plastic bag or a bottle or a fragment makes it further downstream into the system um, maybe and i see that uh, denise wants to say something let me quickly uh, finish by saying that the more observations we do in river systems around the world the stronger our hypothesis grows that most of the plastics or macroplastics that are leaked into the environment will never make it into the ocean. One of the recent, uh, I would say, uh, observation-based models that we that we made uh, actually suggests that less than two percent of plastics leaked into the environment make it to the ocean. So for me, the big question is, what happens to the remaining ninety-eight or ninety-nine percent of the plastics that are lost into the environment? Where do they accumulate? Where do they uh, where do they retain? For how long are they retained? Um, what happens when they are retained? Do they maybe break down in microplastics and then are uh, being emitted into the ocean? That's still possible. But as microplastics themselves, they tend to just get stuck in all kinds of places in river systems, on the riverbanks, on the floodplains, in the vegetation, uh, in floating vegetation, in the sediments, um, along uh, infrastructure. They're, of course, also removed, luckily, by, by people again every now and then. Uh, they are retained in estuaries because there is bidirectional flow, uh, et cetera. Uh, but in the end, it seems that only a small fraction makes it into the ocean. And uh, yeah, we hope to figure out what happens to the rest. Denise? I might just add to Tim's comments. Um, I agree with what you have said, Tim, absolutely. Um, I would say that... The work that we have done as well shows that, yes, most of it's land-based and that the predominant mechanism on land is through human behavior, littering behavior. Next to that, the next major component of movement is along water courses and wind does play a significant but a much more minor role than does human behavior and passage through water courses. I agree with you that much of, um, and I think it's really interesting, so if most, if your work is showing that most doesn't ever reach the ocean, what I would say is that which reaches the ocean, more than 90% of it remains within the coastal zone, the coastal margin, and most of that, like in river systems, gets trapped in the backshore vegetation. 
And so our work, you know, and that of others has shown that, you know, where is all the missing plastic? It's not missing. It's actually in our backshore vegetation along our coastlines, that which makes it to the ocean. There's so much onshore wind and wave forcing that happens that it's actually quite difficult for plastic debris, you know, and other debris to make its way out into the um, out into the open ocean. Yes, it happens, and we know that things can be transported very long distances, particularly with major storms and those sorts of things. However, the lion's share of our waste gets trapped into the backshore vegetation, which in some ways is actually quite a hopeful story because it demonstrates the effectiveness of removing our waste when it's on land, because I think we all know and agree, in spite of the fact that scientists hardly agree on anything across you know, the realm, but that cleaning up the middle of the oceans is by design the most expensive, least effective approach that we could ever take. So stopping it while it's still on land, before it gets to our waterways, and certainly before it gets out into the middle of the ocean, where it's not viable, it's not economical, it's carbon costly, it's resource costly, and it's not likely to be successful, is really worth, I think, us to remember. So, yep, most that does actually reach the ocean is going to stay trapped into that littoral zone or into the coastal margin as well. And again, that points to the value of citizen science activities, which where people tend to go up and clean up in their neighborhoods, clean up the beaches. The one challenge, of course, is that people clean up dirty areas, which are accumulating areas, not source areas. So until we tackle the sources, we will just keep cleaning up those dirty areas forever. And I'll pause there. Thanks. Thank you, Denise. Um, Can I maybe make a very yes, quick of comment? Of course, Tim. Uh, th thanks, Denise, again. This is a very, very nice um, and expansion, I think. I, I just, I, I really like to put things in, into perspective. And, and um, I, I got triggered by the comment uh, by Denise about, you know, why should we clean the oceans? Um, I also asked myself that question and I just <laughs> compared the numbers, right? So I looked at what is the concentration of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in terms of floating plastics? And I, I'm not sure if we, if we agree on that, but I would say this is one of the most plastic polluted areas in the open ocean. Maybe it's the most plastic polluted area in the open ocean. If we compare that concentration with a typical Dutch riverbank, and that's not even an extreme, eh, but just on average, we see that the average concentration of plastics on the Dutch riverbank is 100 to 200 times more than the most polluted place in the open ocean. So I think that just sort of supports the suggestion by Denise that at least we should rethink where we can make most impact with the same amount of effort in terms of preventing and cleaning um, plastic from the environment. Now, just for those who don't know our activity, we don't clean up the open ocean. We clean up rivers, mangroves, and the coastal areas. <laughs> oh, please those. know that was not, that was no way. Well, please, I know, please, I know. It's just a please joke. Don't, please don't try to, to clean the, the bottom of the sea. Huh? No, no, we, we won't. <laughs> we don't have the money. Well, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, something something that's I think uh, one of the benefits of or what's the the Great Garbage Pact has done is actually raised awareness, of, uh, you know, in a way that nothing else has, because uh, rivers are kind of probably already, you know, to most people, consider, you know, at least in the in the uh, developed world, you know, considered kind of polluted. So you know, you, if you say that, you know, most rivers, a lot of the rivers in European rivers have uh, in European in the, in Europe, you don't have any fish or anything left, or you know, sizable. So I think you know. The fact that there's plastic in it is probably, was probably not of us, you know, as great of concern as finding out that you had this huge amount of plastic in the middle of the Pacific. So I think in terms of uh, of, of exposure, I think you know the great pa uh, great uh, Pacific garbage patch was a you know is it was very positive in terms you know getting people to you know as a call to action. Mark, you wanted to um, to ask a question. I think about this huge amount of plastic consumables as we are heading to Christmas now. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So, for, so one of the things that struck me, um, actually, it was like uh, Halloween this year. Is you know, you, I think people are aware of you know the amount of plastic and, and um, in packaging, and you know and how you have to be kind of careful about that. But I'm always kind of, I was kind of slightly appalled at the amount of kind of you know um, very uh, uh, well uh, plastic kind of gizmos, little things that you can find, you know, uh, uh, at Halloween or at Christmas, and I and. I, to me, it doesn't sound 
it doesn't look as if you know uh, the consumer uh, has really uh, um, understood or you know realized that you know this this is also plastic and should probably I don't know um, may, maybe not be you know is is also part of the problem to try and keep it short. Well, Bargavi, maybe you can answer this question or, or Humi Bargavi. Yeah, welcome. sure. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really sorry I joined in a little late. Um, but yeah, one of the things that we've noticed, so um, we, we do a lot of work with, you know, citizen scientists, the so people um, who care about the environment just going out and collecting litter, because as you guys have been talking about, uh, a lot of it generates at land. So the thing with consuming plastic and um, kind of figuring out that it's all linked, um, we did a, a research um, in one of the most polluted, I think, places, in some of the most polluted places, I would say. Um, and one of the things that we found out is that people don't link their actions to the problem. And and that that really goes to answer your question. It's like, okay, yeah, so in the, mov in the moment, yeah, I'm aware that plastic pollution is a thing and all of the things that I'm buying could lead to plastic pollution. But but at the moment when it's like Halloween or Christmas and I'm doing shopping, it just, I don't make that link. and. And so that's why like when people are even like cigarette butts, right? We see so many of them um, littered, that's a problem. Um, they do contain plastic as well. And people don't get that. They, they're like, okay, wait, what? And so, so it's the same thing. And uh, people fail to see that there's a connection and uh, that's why they consume more because well, to them, it's not a problem. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any more questions on this, but this is essentially what we've seen um, around the world. It's not just limited to any specific geographic area um, where there's not that much awareness. It's like even developed nations have the same um, connotations around this. Thank you, Humi. Yes, um, the level of understanding is quite different for countries like uh, Comoros Islands and uh, Africa as a whole, because this, uh, this kind of question is not, uh, is not a question that people ask. You said in the beginning that the community, you, don't, you have to contextualize the, mm -hmm. the community, the way they live, how to feed the family. This is actually the, the, the main issues of, of people. And for instance, when you said that uh, the packaging is a problem, it's not a problem for them. The thing is that you have to go back the 80s, for instance, the, um, the traditional knowledge and all of the activities were, were, with, nat were with nature. And, and now with all the goods from outside, 80% of the goods are from outside, the people don't understand. So the people don't understand and they threw away their garbage. So it's like, uh, again, uh, information first, how to help these people, how to help the, the, the children, how to help these people who are at the crossroads. I mean, in Comoros, um, the islands, uh, with all these boats, all of this, uh, all of this garbage, you can't actually um, uh, uh, stand this, you as you are in the developed country, but in developing country, it's not a problem. This actually uh, a way of life because they say that we don't have any, uh, any solutions. So if Again, the private sector came with with with, um, with the solutions, and also the international organization and the international as the EU with working with uh, such countries. They have to do something with the people, and I think that is not only the legal framework. Is these people who are coming in this country and don't have these people, and uh, you notice that the fishermen are working in traditional way. So they are not only fishermen who are helped by the inter in that international organization who are aware of this problem of waste management and plastic pollution. Well, um, it's, thank you, Humi. It's a, it's a good transition, actually, because uh, uh, we could uh, turn into this, um, the management citizen science. And, and Mark, you could... Uh, maybe add something about that, because uh, today it's the data and information being collected that could be shared with these countries remain largely unconnected and fragmented. So um, uh, how could you help on this side, Mark? Or maybe you don't, you don't have anything to say about that. 
<laughs> because there's a growing number of networks and uh, and citizen science uh, uh, networks. Yeah, no, so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, no okay. Um, I'm, I'll let Francois probably uh, add something to, or quite a lot probably to what I'm going to say. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think it is uh, in terms of from uh, from where I work and you know and uh, look at what the what we're trying to do in terms of, for instance, you know, detecting uh, plastic um, presence via satellites. Um, it's quite, it's quite. So one of the things we're trying to do nowadays is to use more and more inter um, artificial intelligence. And uh, but uh, for artificial intelligence, often you need to kind of, you know, uh, the, the the kind of the algorithm must learn. You need kind of uh, training data. And uh, actually, when you start looking at uh, what's available in terms of, you know, uh, accurate. Um, uh, localization both in time and in space of um, plastic where it's been found it is not so much around that is actually usable by the by, by the community um, so so this is um and uh, you know obviously you know you can you kind of realize that this is, you know with all the citizen science that's been happening around the world uh, there's probably a lot more information that um, that has been gathered but that you know is not yet available in a kind of a easy way to the uh, uh, scientific community. So I'm not talking about, you know, uh, at the moment from with satellites, we can't really see, you know, like a, a, a small accumulation of debris. You need a certain amount of of large, uh, you know, certain accumulation of uh, plastic debris on the beaches or in river or in river um, in rivers to be able, you know, for it to be uh, detected by satellites. But, um, but yeah, I guess you know we, we would need, you know, uh, some form of a unified um, international plastic location kind of uh, database which would help the scientific, the scientific, scientific community. Uh, I'll let Francois. Uh, Francois and then Bargavi. Uh, yes, it was it was more to answer the, uh, what was said. I mean, I fully agree that the people are just, I mean, uh, uh, affected directly without any action done and so on. But I mean, in Europe, we, we have completely different from uh, developing countries. Uh, I heard uh, Ursula von der Leyen saying that, I mean, the European Commission will rule on microplastics very soon and uh, within the zero pollution action plan and uh, planning for some water, uh, wastewater treatment plan and so on. So it seems to be very highly sophisticated. I understand it's needed someplace, uh, but I mean, in some other countries that would be more, I mean, a very simple uh, way to be have. I mean, uh, plastic must go in a bin. Now, I mean, that's very simple. So it's maybe just a question of information. And, uh, uh, and then, I, I understand also that we need some infrastructures, but uh, you see, when you look at the type of litter we find at sea, it's mainly from consumers. We do find pellets from industry, but that's just a few percent and uh, very localized and so on. We do have some accident and so on. I mean, I fully understand, but most of them are really from, from consumers. And so if, and I also understand that we have seven billions, more than seven billion sources ourselves, and uh, it's complex to manage because these are very diverse. But I mean, a simple way to we have could change the things. I mean, I mean, and uh, I think it's quite important to inform the people and literacy and so on because it, uh, otherwise that will just continue. And I mean, it's not a, a free a free way to uh, let the plastic go in the environment. Bargavi? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, when uh, Mark was speaking. Uh, it kind of reminded me of the work that Literati does of like sending people to, to collect litter data. So when you capture a piece of photo of where the litter is, uh, the AI or the ML computer vision model, it actually tells you um, what the litter is. So you would know what is it, what material is it, is it plastic, paper, etc. what type of object it is, is it a bottle can or a bottle cap? Um, and it, it would tell you what brand it is. If, if it's you know trained on that, because again, training data is based on whatever the community has been able to collect. And I think um, that's where it gets really granular with citizen scientists around the world. It's just that um, if they're able, like, because people have been cleaning up forever, right? Um, it's just now that they're trying to learn about how they can collect data so that it becomes proof. Because if they wanna go ahead and approach say a corporate or a, a city or, or policymakers, whoever, they've got to have some sort of proof. And I think what I'm trying to get to is that the more and more people become aware of the problem, um, I think there's like, we're reverse engineering it. It's because people are taking action now. And so with the action that they take, they're able to raise awareness into the community. So where people do not necessarily understand 
um, that littering or you know mismanaged waste um, is a problem, they now see that okay, there's so many people working towards something, and and then they realize, oh wait, maybe my steps are the ones that are causing this problem, and uh, here's how we can solve it. And so I think the technology plays a huge role in this because it's you're trying to simplify something that is so complex um, that you're trying to solve, uh, be it plastic pollution or just um, getting people to put something in a bin. So it's it's like for for me sitting here in like this beautiful room, it's it's very easy for me to say yeah, it's, it's as easy to just um, sort your waste properly and then put it in a bin. Uh, but the reality of the situation is you can have the bins, but if you don't have the collection, then there's no point of your bin. Or you could have the bins in the collection, but if people aren't aware that there's a bin there, um, there's no point of it. Or you could have all of those and you don't really know what is leaking into the environment. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I think all of these go like hand in glove. Um, and what starts as basic education to people needs to go into, go back into how, you know, the infrastructure is, how policy is, how um, collection happens so that all of this that's on the land doesn't really end up in the waterways and in the oceans and all of that. Um, so yeah, it just gives, it gives race to the fact that it's a people and it's like a technology problem and solution that um, starts with awareness and then ends with action. That's what I believe. And there are people in the, in the community who at least are trying to classify things that they find so that they can then go and use that information to start conversations similar to this one, um, but with people who can actually be like, okay, yeah, so I signed this off, you can change X, Y, and Z. So, yeah. I don't know, a lot of, I see there's a lot of Europeans in the room. Have you heard of Antiflu and the change that they made recently? I think that's big and uh, it takes, it gives me a lot of pride that uh, they use literary data for that change uh, to move from plastic packaging to a more sustainable paper um, packaging. And just, that's just very small. And that's like a demonstration of the power of data and community. Um, and these are not people who are scientists. These are just people like individuals who, who came together, right? Citizen science. Um, so yeah. Um, I think, I believe you had a question uh, regarding uh, how the citizen science can help monitoring methods uh, to mark. Yeah, so that, that was, that's a great point. So my question was essentially like, you know, uh, one of the things that individuals are lacking is sort of a sense of direction. Like maybe they know the problem, maybe they want to help, but the sense of direction is probably lacking. And because while citizen science is something that can be evaluated and structured, um, we don't see that many projects that directly could help solve this, you know, plastic pollution sort of problem. So my question to you is, is there, like, what is the basic thing that people can do at large, like at crowdsource level? Um, how can they help be part of the solution? So are you, are you talking to kind of uh, helping the scientific community to kind of move forward with, well, I mean, I think uh, uh, this is a, but I, you know, there are kind of a much wider uh, initiatives, but I think it's it's all about, um, you know, um, identifying uh, and, you know, what I was saying, you know, a, a database of, you know, plastic lo uh, localizations uh, in both uh, time and space. And uh, also, you know, if people can, if the, Tools are there, you know. Maybe the type of plastic. This is the type of information that is that, that is missing. You know, like I was saying, you know, what do you know? You, you need, um, especially with all this um, uh, fine interpretation of the various uh, spectra from that you know that uh, a satellite can um, observe. Uh, you, we need uh, uh, as much information as we can to train the models and to kind of improve our uh, uh, the technology. So yeah, you know, uh, any anything from uh, and at some and at some and at some place we need. Um, you know, some form of uh, international kind of, you know, pool of, you know, somewhere where all the information can be found easily or, you know, a single database that, you know, people don't have to kind of, uh, all the science, scientists don't have to kind of, you know, uh, dig into ver uh, various different uh, uh, databases. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
some form of coherence. Yes, please. Of, uh, you know. Sorry. Thank you, Omar. Yeah. I th yes, I think it's, uh, it's just a dream. Uh, thinking about having one person or one computer uh, understanding everything what is happening in the ocean. And it's also a dream that uh, a small NGO locally may solve the problem because we are receiving from other places through the ocean rivers and so on. So we need a lot of things and probably very strong measures and strong actions. I mean, for science, for instance, that could be citizen, like a large NGOs that are really, I mean, improving our knowledge, and it's really, uh, really good. And also for solution, the ban of plastic bags, for instance, uh, could be very important. So we understand that we need some plastic bags, some case of single-use plastic, like during the pandemic, for instance. So there is some reason that we craft them and so on. But I mean, we, I mean, having the pressure from industry to sell more plastics and having, having the consumer asking for more, I mean, uh, uh, wrapping and so on, I think it's a problem and we have to, to find it. But anyway, it's impossible with just one team or some teams only or what some citizen on to solve a problem. And it must be large scale, uh, not only for science, even citizen, but also for solution. And that's the only problem. So the agreement to come, for instance, with the future ban of plastic in a way too. I understand we do have to adapt to the situation, what is needed and so on, to solve the problem of what has been invested and so on. But I mean, it must be global. It cannot be unless it's for local situation. You see, for instance, typically uh, at national level in France, but it's also the same in many countries, uh, ruling on smoking in, on beaches is not a privilege of states, but it's a privilege of cities and mayors and so on. So, I mean, this kind of situation, binding this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, forbidden to smoke on beach can be uh, taken locally and there is no problem with that and it must be encouraged. But I mean, uh, 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 it cannot be done nationally when the bans uh, can be ruled, for instance, in that case that will help a lot, you know, and uh, in, at each level and during the life cycle of plastics, it is, can help anyway. Tim? Yeah, well, thanks for bringing up the topic of citizen science. So I, I personally think that, of course, there is, there is great potential in citizen science for scaling up monitoring efforts, for scaling up uh, cleanup efforts, for uh, scaling up awareness, et cetera. And that, that helps the science, the policies make, policy, policy makers and other stakeholders. The difficult thing is, and I, I also partly agree with Francois, like many of these aspects are just dreams because, I mean, there is a lot of people motivated to do something. And they may take the initiative to do something, but the difficult, most difficult thing is, is to keep people involved, to keep people motivated in contributing to science or cleanup or, or other things. And, um, uh, and, and we see that in practice, right? Like the only, I think, uh, successful large scale citizen science initiatives, they are successful because they're dedicated local teams that are able to keep the contact with the volunteers, to disseminate the findings, to update the protocols, to make sure that the data are consistent, that the cleanup is rightly organized. And you, you, you need a certain degree of infrastructure and professional involvement to, to, to guide that. Um, and that's very difficult, of course, to organize that at a very large scale, at a global or continental scale. So I think finding this right balance between very strong local uh, projects, local commitments to, uh, I guess, to guide citizen science initiatives and then making sure that you have a sort of um, sort of umbrella initiative that makes sure that the methods are harmonized, that the data are transferable, that we can compare data collected in Indonesia with, with the Netherlands, etc. Um, and only then, I think, we can successfully upskill all these kinds of initiatives. Uh, just quickly, again, like if we look at what, what are successful examples, well, I mentioned the successful example in the Netherlands. There are also other examples in, in Germany and Europe, but also, for example, um, limited or projects of limited duration in, for example, Indonesia or Malaysia have already demonstrated that if you if you target your audience, if you have support and if you have infrastructure, you can really uh, benefit from such citizen science involvement for uh, for science and, uh, and impact in the end. Alena, you wanted to add something or is it too late? <laughs> it's a little bit right, but it's fine. I, I wanted to, to what, what Francois was saying about the, the bands uh, and the replication uh, uh, of, uh, of successful bands that have been happening also in Europe uh, at the international level. I just wanted to say that uh, we just cannot introduce bands, uh, even though it you know it's 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 a good and easy solution. 
solution. But if we don't have alternatives on the market that are easily accessible to the citizens to actually, you know, replace uh, those products, then it's very difficult. So that's why also at the EU level, maybe we are going, you know, step by step. Um, maybe sometimes, you know, people would say we are going very slowly. But we, we cannot just introduce bans on all different plastic products that exist if we don't have, uh, you know, easily accessible uh, also uh, for a good price uh, alternatives that uh, people can uh, can use. So I just wanted to point this out that, uh, you know, bans are good where the alternatives exist on the market. Huh? Yeah, we do understand that very well. No problem with that. I mean, we just focus, have to focus the research on that topic. Yeah. Gwen? Sorry. Yeah, I think that about bans also uh, something that um, we don't, uh, we're not really truly aware or I was not actually when I was part of a panel um, uh, last month, I think it was, um, there was a speaker from Kenya and she was uh, relating uh, and t telling us about um, the ban that was uh, put on plastic bags over there. And um, actually, um, that was great, right? Uh, we all think it's great. But then the, the, the people were smuggling plastic bags back into the country. And so, and then, you know, there, there's always uh, something to, to think about how how can policies work locally and how can how can we truly make, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, um, how to how to raise awareness enough and uh, to the people so that then there, what we do doesn't doesn't uh, add to another issue and makes it even more uh, difficult to to uh, work on. So that's really what I wanted to say about the bands, which are four bands. Um, I, th I think it's really great, but it's, it's sometimes we don't have uh, all the, the data as, uh, to have the consequences of uh, what we do. Kevin? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I do have to agree that, you know, bans might be not a feasible option because I had a meeting, uh, actually a meeting with the government of Surabaya uh, earlier last month and we were talking about bans and, you know, realizing on how bans uh, can or cannot be implemented to Surabaya. And yes, we do have to agree that implementing a ban might be harder if we don't have a solution yet. But what we can do is to kind of create that mindset of, hey, we should switch to these alternatives. We, uh, we should kind of move away from plastic bags or any other single use plastic to something that's reusable, something that they can use over and over again. And only after that, only after the citizen is fully aware and they fully adapted, then we can try to uh, kind of lower down the production. So it's not uh, fully banning the usage of plastic bags, but it's lowering the production of plastic bags and also uh, all those single use items uh, slowly in the future. Of course, it's going to take time, but if we all can agree that this is a great place to start, if this is a great method to start to reduce the number of production and to encourage the citizen to use more alternatives, then I think that will be a great option to uh, rather than banning single use items in general. François? Yes, just to uh, give some more information. I mean, my feeling is that I mean, European Commission, European Commission has been really first in that way. I mean, uh, there is a directive on plastic pollution, and there is already some single use that will be banned. I understand that will be delayed in the time because there will there have been some investment and recycling and so on. So it means it will be managed. But I mean, uh, they have been really effective. I would say and efficient. No. Maybe I, I, I'd like to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I couldn't, yes. Um, Luke, do you, do you want to add something? Sorry, I had a yes. power cut. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to, uh, to to make a couple of comments. One on uh, alternatives. And I, I think it's important uh, to, to use, uh, among things, life cycle analysis when we, we talk about uh, uh, alternatives to, uh, to the various solutions, because sometimes, uh, there is um, a genuine feeling that uh, one solution is better than another in terms of uh, environmental impact, and it's not. Uh, and, and we have to be very careful not to uh, to go to to the wrong solutions. 
Um, so I, I will not name a specific packaging whatsoever, but uh, we, we, we should pay attention to this. And, and there are, uh, again, we need to use science uh, when, uh, when we make uh, those uh, choices. Um, second comment I, I wanted to make, and we mentioned that earlier, uh, th there are ways, uh, I mean, financial incentives that can be used, uh, not everywhere probably, because uh, what we have, for instance, with deposit systems uh, in Germany, Norway, uh, Sweden, uh, Netherlands, uh, um, also in Australia, by the way, uh, is something very efficient. If it's the right amount of money, if it's uh, in line with the uh, purchasing power of people, of course, uh, where you have issues of uh, purchasing power, maybe uh, it's not so easy to uh, to do so, and it's a uh, different levers you have to uh, to tackle. But when you when you go to these systems, really uh, you capture uh, the, the the flow of material. And um, I often um, mention the, the, the case of uh, Lidl in Germany uh, with the reverse vending machines because they've been doing since 2004 uh, the, the, the closed loop on, on the system. It's one example. I'm not saying it can apply everywhere because of the collection system and so on, but they, there are ways to, uh, to change uh, and, and to be a real uh, circular. Never perfect, but uh, that could be a good trend as well. Kevin? Oh, sorry, I haven't uh, lowered my hand. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, homie, homie. Sorry because um, yeah, there, it's a it's a mix up here on my computer. Homie. Yes. You wanted to add something related to um, the, to the topic we are talking about, uh, but uh, otherwise we can talk with Mark about monitoring because actually we are talking about monitoring then bans and. Uh, so, uh, I just, and, and Francois wanted to ask Mark uh, if we could refine the models for predicting uh, plastic inputs to the ocean. Yes, I mean, I think it's a real question huh, about the validity and the relevance of model, modeling. Uh, I mean, go step by step, and at the end, in some decades, I will say, we will be in position to trust any results coming from models. But I mean, it's a long story. and. Uh, uh, we do have real data and most often, especially on coastal water, where the litter is, as said by Denise, uh, I mean, it doesn't fit. And uh, so we, are, we have a real question there because it's so complex to manage that uh, so real data may be interesting through satellites could be uh, by a collection and so on. But it will take time before we can uh, feed the models uh, so that they give relevant. Uh, and I would like the, the position from Luca on that, for instance. Yeah, no, I think uh, this is a, a every anybody who's ever worked with models know that you know they can be um, they can be well most often they are very wrong and uh, actually you know the most of the improvements we've seen in modeling uh, generally have come through what we call data simulations in other words uh, including uh, observational data to improve the model you know so this is how you know a lot of the atmospheric models uh, so which give us our weather have improved so much uh, you know no. no Visibly by using uh, satellite data and also in situ data from the drifting buoys. Uh, so there's about a, a thousand four hundred drifting buoys around the world giving uh, SST and also pressure data. Sorry, sea surface temperature data and uh, sea level pressure in order to improve the uh, um, the large scale numerical models which give us the weather. So yeah, no, I think uh, I mean Francois said it all. You know, it's uh, it's kind of a step by step uh, Im improvements. Uh, you know, we need uh, uh, there's a lot of well, for those who don't know models, but a lot of uh, a lot of processes, anything that's kind of smaller than the the kind of the resolution of the model, uh, is not uh, is not well represented. So we need to kind of uh, improve uh, on all this, and it's a very it's a very slow process. So I don't know how long it will take until we have something that's kind of uh, re reliable. Um, some people are, you know, um, you know, people are still working on kind of improving all the all the model schemes, but it's uh, <laughs> I don't know how long it will take, and that. I think also that's uh, we, it's uh, models are sometimes a kind of a go-to solution uh, because you know uh, it's it's something that can be done. But um, I think uh, you know the, the more time you spend with models, uh, the more you realize that you need uh, you keep needing observational data, and so you know all these various initiatives uh, of citizen science or satellite observations are are needed. So I'll stop there because I could go on again for hours. <laughs> François, then Denise, 
Uh, now maybe I will let Denise answer. Okay, first. Denise. Sure. So we use a lot of models um, that are founded in empirical data. So we're using numerical models for a lot of it. And I think one of the things that's worth noting is that a lot of the model predict, you know, projections and predictions about not only how much plastic is going into the oceans, but in rivers and those sorts of things are based upon the base presumption that how many people live within the area is the main and most important component. And when we've actually gone out and tested that and evaluated, because we use a whole suite of components that we include with the you know, observational data that we record, and frankly, the population density, how many people live in the area, is not by any stretch the most important thing to consider. And so I think you know, it was a great place to start with Jenna's work, with some of the papers that have followed. However, when we actually go out and test those ideas and look more broadly across the landscape, we may learn um, that some of the presumptions that we've made are actually not as accurate as we had thought. And so while I agree that models are not perfect, by definition, every model is wrong, I would also say that perfection is the enemy of done, which is what I tell my graduate students, <laughs> and that we are better to work in, from a direction and make incremental improvements while still operating from the precautionary principle. You know, we don't need to know everything that's going on everywhere to make evidence-based decisions with the best available knowledge that we have at the time. And it's okay to shift some of those things as we have more understanding. You know, it's okay to um, make incremental improvements on our models, but let us not be paralyzed or not continue to make improvements because we don't have all of the perfect data at hand. So we've yeah. been collecting data in you know, 15, 20 countries around the world. It is not exhaustive, but we know a lot more now than we did before. And part of what we know is how infinitely complex the systems are and how variable the drivers are in different communities and different countries, et cetera. Yet we can still look at some overall broad scale patterns that can be useful. They're not perfect, absolutely. Francois, I know we yeah. agree on this. No, no, no. But it's but a reasonable yeah. starting place. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the problem is that some of the model in terms of prediction of inputs, for instance, that they, they, they're just uh, predicting uh, uh, starting from a situation when, where, where nothing has been done, when in fact it's already, we do have a lot of action already started. It will take years before and uh, we will see the change. But so, I mean, we cannot base uh, all the modeling on uh, wrong data, we say. But what is important, and it's a real question that is coming to me, the general thing, I started already uh, working on my return, it was in 1992, I would come to another question, I would say. And the feeling I have is that it has become something like the, for the climate. We do have the models, we lack data, we do have the uh, real uh, uh, things every day, you know, every day's life, and plastic is uh, affecting everybody. And uh, there is a, a debate that is coming between both, and I would like to have the position from policymakers such as, for instance, uh, Alena on that, yeah. Because, I mean, the feeling we have as scientists is that there will be some wrong, wrong discussion, uh, wrong announcements, when also we will have some relevant position and relevant uh, uh, data to, uh, to, so you see that what the question, uh, what the question is actually. So, uh, Alena, and then G uh, Tim wanted to jump into the conversation. Alena. Yes, uh, thank you, Francois. Uh, of course, uh, climate change has uh, received uh, great attention uh, in the in the last years. Uh, and, uh, and especially after the first agreement, and I think we also had the momentum for the for the plastic pollution uh, when we were adopting the single plastic directive. That was the big momentum, and uh, everyone started talking about this uh, a bit more with the citizens. And uh, and I'm glad that we just do not have debates uh, uh, at the EU level uh, as the policymakers. We really. Um, we are uh, we are putting forward concrete measures uh, and obligations, uh, and we also have some targets. Of course, uh, if uh, uh, if you don't have uh, a concrete measures uh, to achieve these targets, uh, then uh, it's uh, it's just uh, again a very uh, very flow uh, prediction. Uh, and uh, and so I'm um, uh, we of course. Uh, we need uh, the knowledge uh, as policymakers. We need data. We need observation. Uh, you were talking about 
uh, about different uh, application and ocean observation. We are using those data, but we own a lot of them. Even though there is a lot outside there, in order to make concrete target, uh, we need to base ourselves on some data. So for now, what we are doing with, with for example, the measures under the Singles Busting Directive, uh, uh, what we are doing, we are implementing the new measures. So uh, we have put in place uh, some conception reduction, extended producer responsibility schemes, also the bands. And for, for all of this, we have put together also monitoring and reporting obligations. Like this, we will receive the data that we need because uh, we would we could put together uh, and put forward more ambitious targets and ambitious measures. But if we don't have the data to base ourselves on, uh, it, it would just not be possible. So for now, what we are doing until the revision of the uh, of the legislation that we are planning in 2027, we will gather the data from the member states for a uh, very concrete example on the amount of the fishing gear that's placed on the market, on the amount of the fishing gear or the passively fished waste, on the waste fished in the fishing nets uh, that are brought back to shore and then that are brought back uh, to waste managers. So we will gather all this data and then based on this we may put forward concrete targets um, that yeah uh, in uh, 2027. Huh? So for now uh, we are concentrating our efforts on the implementing and reporting uh, and, and all the monitoring of, of course to gather the data to base our actions on it afterwards. Thank you, Alena. Team? Yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, modeling. So I, I think all what you said is, is quite valid. Eh? Most models are wrong or basically uh, all, all models are wrong, but it really depends on how you want to utilize the outcome of those models for, for action. And I think what's sometimes often forgotten or, or not really emphasized is that there are so many different models that work differently and that can be used to answer different questions and serve different purposes. And I think actually we can also be a bit more optimistic in terms of what kind of models we can develop that can be informative for science and policy. Of course, for example, I think the most classic models in plastics, they revolve around making mass balances, right? So how, how much plastic is flowing in or out in specific ecosystems. And we know those are very uncertain because there is not uh, enough data, because the data is maybe uh, by itself already quite uncertain. So these types of models are very uncertain. Also, if you think in terms of uh, following specific items and knowing what the, the, the ultimate fate or the transport mechanisms of individual items are, that is very difficult to predict because an individual bottle or a plastic bag, who knows what is going to happen to these plastic bags. However, if you zoom out and we, we, we try to learn from our observations and try to sort of aggregate what we see in the field, there is actually quite some things that we do see. For example, if you look at river systems, we know that if you have river banks with vegetation, it is more likely that plastic will accumulate there. If you have a river system with infrastructure, such as dams or sluices, it is more likely that plastic will accumulate there. So what I really think is that if you try to work that into a, a different kinds of modeling approach, where we're not trying to predict the source and, and fate of each individual item, but start thinking in terms of risk and likelihoods of the presence and accumulation of plastics in, for example, a river system or a coastal area, that can be, I think, extremely informative for planning our data collection and our monitoring, but also to steer action and to uh, think of uh, efficient mitigation and cleanup efforts. Um, yeah, so that's what Alena? I think. I just wanted to give an example because in my uh, in my team there are uh, colleagues working a lot on ocean, ocean observation, and uh, and we have a, a, a very good uh, program that the, through, through the Copernicus Marine Services, where different monitorings are also possible, and we were already talking about the numeric mo modeling. And, uh, and I wanted to just give this example because we have the, uh, the models of uh, ocean uh, um, particles tracking or, or the drift modeling uh, as they call it. So, and they are based on the ocean currents and, uh, and different uh, water layers. And so they, they can potentially also indicate the, the po possible transport pathways uh, or the average time that's taken uh, for the plastics to travel from uh, from the source or from one destination to another. So this also allows us to monitor where where plastic enters the ocean, how it then 
spread, actually, across the open uh, open space, and uh, or we can also estimate how long have they been there. So uh, those Copernicus marine services are used uh, also in our in our policy making, and we are very much uh, following uh, following these. There are many applications, but yeah, I just wanted to give you the example that we can also track when we are on a, on an open uh, open ocean. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you, can Elena. I, can I just add? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, Mark. Yeah, um, yeah, no. So, so um, I, yeah, I think the Copernicus Initiative and what Europe, Europe has done in terms of uh, developing those those models, uh, which kind of uh, feed currents into the drift models, is is very very important and is actually crucial, and it's something that uh, uh, we use on a regular basis. And uh, I'm, I'm maybe I was a bit too harsh at the beginning, you know, because. So people kind of expect a lot of from models, and uh, my point was not that you cannot use models. I mean, you know, as Tim has said, and um, you know, they they are very useful. It's just that you kind of a you, you don't get a kind of a, an absolute truth from them. Uh, you need to kind of use them carefully, and but they are incredibly useful. And uh, I, I think also um, what I find is very important, and particularly in what I do, is the combination of technology. So uh, we use models, but we also use uh, in situ observation. So we try and follow plastic by tagging the plastic uh, and following where it goes and then when the when we when we have a, a model solution we can see if this um if this makes sense or if we you know we've some of the, our hypothesis are wrong um so my you know uh, you know i'm not saying don't use models because i use them every day but i'm you know i'm saying you have to kind of you know you have to be careful but, and uh, but the fusion of technology so modeling in situ observations, citizen science, satellite data can all help us, you know, to answer these questions such as you know where where does where's the plastic going, where will it accumulate, what is likely to to happen, what events uh, mobilize, remobilizes uh, uh, the plastic and all these things. So no, no, I mean, my, um, so the question is, you know, uh, uh, you know, do the models need to be improved? Yes. Uh, are they useful? Yes, they are very useful. And they're probably, you know, so, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Well, time for the last part. Now, recently there has been a proliferation of business like joint industry initiatives and partnerships. Uh, legislative responses, public awareness campaigns, providing an impetus of action. Is innovation solutions and actions um, to achieve the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals 14, life below water. So I think uh, Bart Gavi uh, wanted to ask a question to Luke about uh, the industry. Yep, thank you for that. You yes. So, I mean, my only question was, uh, it was it was around this particular trend that's going on, um, at least uh, back in Qatar, where, you know, there's not that much awareness about plastic or pollution. Like, honestly, that country does not care enough. They don't have, they don't see the problem. Um, so there's this recent buzz around bioplastics. And uh, when we consider, you know, their impact, um, are we really able to like take a stand or to support or certify them? Like, are they a good alternative to um, plastic? Because I mean, you know, there's all of these. These are the questions that you know common people ask because there's always going to be like a, a a term like bio in front of it makes it green. I don't know if it's green. Yeah. So, well, is it, are bioplastics even a thing? We talked about this before you arrived, actually. So uh, okay. My bad. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, um, you, uh, yeah, it was relating uh, to your question about how the industry uh, can drive change. Uh, I think right. you wanted to ask. Yeah. So, Luke? Well, uh, I think driving change uh, uh, or this kind of change, uh, you don't drive it alone. Uh, it, it's by working together. And uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm very happy to be here to to hear a number of things uh, I'm not used to to hear sometimes or to have uh, different uh, uh, sets of uh, information. Um, well, f first of all, uh, we, we do help, for instance, our customers to uh, to switch from uh, because we, we are mainly in the PET business. I, I should mention that or remind that uh, we help our customers to convert from PET to uh, recycled PET. Uh, it, it's um, it's not a huge difficulty, but requires some uh, some skills and requires some uh, some input. And uh, we have a huge demand on that and the, the proof for that. Uh, is the um, uh, let's say the the price increase of uh, recycled PT, 
And, and by the way, uh, one of the main problems we are uh, facing is the lack of input material. The capacity in Europe uh, for recycling PET uh, is well above, let's say, at least 30% above uh, the use of RPT. Uh, uh, sorry, about the, um, uh, above the capa capability of providing a PET uh, for, for these uh, recycling plants. So th th that, that's, uh, that's one area w w which is quite interesting. The, the, the more we can use, uh, the, the more we will use in this industry. We have brand owners, we have uh, our customers, who have committed uh, to pretty high numbers uh, in terms of uh, recycled PT uh, usage. Actually, uh, the average is probably uh, 10 to 15 percent above uh, what um, uh, the single use plastic regulation is asking for. And they are not only committing for, for Europe, but also for other countries. I'm back also to, to some uh, consideration of uh, regulation because uh, in countries like uh, China, uh, India uh, or Thailand, you cannot uh, use recycled PT back into uh, a PT bottle because uh, there is no regulation there. We have one since 2008 in Europe uh, with uh, a proper set of uh, rules. We have some in the uh, USA with the, uh, uh, the FDA, but uh, it's not yet available in China. I guess this will be uh, soon, uh, sooner than later, because I think they, they understand the interest of that. Um, in India, I don't know. In Thailand, probably it will come also. Um, but we, we, we are facing a situation uh, where uh, definitely uh, the industry has taken uh, quite a turn. Um, not only us, I mean our customers, uh, in front of uh, the plastic proliferation, is this good or bad? By the way, I should mention one thing, is that our customers, they don't sell plastic. They sell their product. They sell water, they sell coke, they sell... So uh, they, they are not uh, uh, heavily attached to a packaging material. However, they have chosen uh, PT for a number of reasons. We mentioned economical reasons, uh, recyclability, um, carbon footprint as well. So th th there's a set, uh, a set of reasons uh, why uh, these materials are chosen. Um, and uh, I can tell you also that uh, we are looking, uh, our industry is looking at alternatives, uh, but uh, again, it has to um, uh, not to be worse than what we have today. I think that's, that's important. And um, listening and, uh, and working together on, on solutions is very important. Uh, it's it's very frustrating, of course, when you see uh, products into the sea where they should not be, uh, definitely. And we we acknowledge it's a huge problem. It's not something we can uh, uh, just uh, hide from ourselves and uh, and pray for for that to to go over or to be forgotten. That's no longer possible. Um, so and and. I'd like to say also that um, uh, industry, uh, the packaging industry I belong to, uh, has done a lot of work and will do and will continue to do a lot of work uh, reducing packaging weight. We divided uh, probably by three uh, the weight of packaging uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, I, I'm not sure we'll divide by three again, but uh, we'll continue this effort. And anyway, this is part of uh, regulation we have uh, nearly everywhere. Um, and. Um, and incorporate more and more recycled PT um, together with our customers. Thank you, Luc. Bagabi? Yes, I just wanted to uh, add to that. First of all, thank you for answering my question. I think it's great for you know, taking steps in the right direction. Um, so uh, my question was more in terms of, well, if individuals, let's, just, let's go back to the citizen science community, they want to start a conversation with the industry saying that, okay, this is probably a problem, can we do something about it? Can we talk about it? Um, because I've found, let's say XYZ brand, XYZ material, plastic in the environment where it's not supposed to be, can we do something about changing that material? So what, in your opinion, would be the right way to approach this? If there are, like, would they go directly to the policymakers or would they go directly to the industry? Like, how can they have that conversation with the industry? Because I don't think, um, plastic pollution could be solved without, you know, said stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any steps or are there any particular information, pieces of information that, you know, would help? 
Well, uh, it, it's it's a pretty wide question, actually. Um, I, and we are approaching the end of the debate. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, they, they, they always. I, I think again, uh, it's uh, we we have to look at uh, this question uh, uh, from a value chain perspective, not only from one actor versus the other, opposing the other whatsoever. I think we are, all have a role, and I cannot say you cannot say industry will solve everything. This is not true. You cannot say it's a fault of uh, the consumer. It, 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 it's it's partially uh, we have a responsibility at the various level of the chain. We have a responsibility, and and the point through this kind of exchange, through uh, the participation with our uh, representatives, uh, we we can work on on these questions. But we we should be. I'm open to a lot of discussions. Uh, to, to talk to uh, children in schools or, or do stuff like that is also very important. So I try Thank to be uh, short on, on, on that. Thank answer. you, Denise. Denise. I guess just a comment and then sort of a follow up question briefly. So I think it's really good to be mindful of unintended consequences. We do not have the waste infrastructure to recover materials from bioplastics and many of these other materials. So while there is sometimes interest from industry and other areas and a willingness, we should be very mindful of unintended consequences that may come from requesting a new material or a new polymer or something because we don't have the infrastructure and those products or new materials can pollute the waste stream as a comment. And to you, I guess, Luke, one of the things that I'm hearing, and as you mentioned, we've seen quite a tremendous amount of light weighting of materials over the last decades. However, for materials to have added value, we are also seeing some multinationals shifting a little bit more sometimes even to heavy weighting some of the materials so that there's a higher probability that they will be recovered rather than lost into the environment. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Two, two quick comments. Uh, sometimes this comes from uh, the consumer uh, demand because when you have a too light package, uh, this is not very practical. And we always have to listen to uh, consumer demand. And the second thing, yes, indeed, if we go too far in terms of light weighting, maybe we have a little bit more losses in the recycling process. So there could be some uh, some interest or some threshold, let's say, not to go uh, beyond. But there are still areas in a bottle where you can save material and it's, uh, let's say, it's our everyday job to reduce the size of the neck, to, uh, you know, to work on areas which are not uh, we, which have a function that can be uh, either improved or lightweighted without uh, consequences uh, for the consumer. Because for, for, for us, we, we have an approach which is not lightweighting for lightweighting, but uh, which is really uh, what we have called right weighting, uh, meaning that you need to ensure a function, the protection of the product, uh, which is the, the first essential function that we need to ensure with packaging. The rest, advertisement and so on, has uh, some debate around it, of course, uh, because it's sometimes excessive uh, material on secondary or tertiary packaging, for instance. But yes, it's a right weight approach we, we need to have. And again, uh, the right weight is to uh, not only for consumer, but for the recycling process as to be, uh, let's say, compatible with recycling process. Gwen? Yes, um, so uh, first of all, I, I wanted to say uh, thank you, Luke, to uh, to say that uh, you were actually happy to be in this um, round table because you were not uh, always speaking with the people that are here with us today. And that's exactly what uh, I wanted to achieve today is uh, this level of uh, discussion, um, ideas bounce back, um, so that so that we and to be honest with all of you, uh, this was um, the the roundtable I wanted to hear as well. So that's why I put it together, right? And so um, and so this level of collaboration, because I've always uh, really been interested in uh, collaborating with uh, a lot of uh, different stakeholders in uh, my entire professional career, and, and this is. Um, this is something that we need, I think, uh, in uh, in the plastic um, field and uh, marine litter. And uh, that way, I had a question for you, Elena, actually, and I wanted to understand and know if uh, other countries um, are um, 
um, coming to the EU to ask for um, advice for a policy framework or things like that, because often in the Western world, we go towards other countries and we say, this is what we do, uh, we need to do that. But is, is the opposite happening so that this, this level of uh, need, understanding and collaborating to uh, potentially uh, offer um, uh, support, uh, not help, but really um, this level of collaborating so that we can all uh, work against plastic pollution and uh, see plastics the way it was intended to be at the very first when it was invented as a noble uh, material. Of course, uh, the, um, the, the fight against uh, marine plastic pollution is not only EU challenge, it's a global one. So, of course, the, these uh, we are having also at the international level, we are of, um, we are part of, uh, of of the discussions in, in the framework of the G7, the G20, the UN, uh, different programs, where of course uh, we gather with all the like-minded uh, uh, governments and states where we discuss uh, what we are doing at the EU level. We are exchanging our our uh, experiences uh, in uh, in the. Well, from the legislation point of view, but also uh, for, from the from the citizens' involvement, from the awareness raising measures, etc. So of course, these uh, these are happening and these are happening for for quite a, quite some time already at the at the international level. We are also um, it, it's not directly from my field, but I know that the colleagues that are also doing a trade negotiations at the international level with um, with. with States all over the all over the world, they are including the component of the of the of the pollution and the, and the and marine pollution also in their discussions. Uh, but then, of course, we are uh, completely open to any um, uh, give any advice or or just uh, share our best practices uh, uh, with uh, with um, any regions or or the states all over the world. Uh, we have been approached also bilaterally. So this is also something that 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 is happening on a quite a regular basis. But we are also learning ourselves huh? because the, the single plastic directive was only adopted in 2019 and actually came into really to force uh, legally this year. So uh, we will be learning ourselves huh? step by step also from the implementation and uh, and also to see what the challenges are and uh, uh, ourselves huh? so <laughs> but yes so this the discussions are happening at the international level and uh, we are trying our best to share uh, to share the best practices we have at the EU level with other like-minded uh, countries thank you Alina thank you unfortunately we have to conclude this very rewarding and instructive roundtable we can see that uh, the speed at which ocean plastic pollution is capturing public attention is very encouraging. It is vital that uh, we use this momentum to make progress towards healthy, resilience and clean oceans, the topic of this UN Ocean Decade Laboratory. So I would like to conclude by reminding in a few words that the best waste is that which is not produced. I'm quoting my boss. Uh, beach and coastal cleanup is a growing and important component of many national waste management policies. A 2019 study concluded that removing plastics from the marine environment not only reduced the overall volume, but also the amount of plastics entering the environment via ingestion by wildlife and saved wildlife. So connecting all the different responses and actions of governments, businesses and citizens is now critically important. I know you know. Uh, all our guests in their own way uh, and each in their own discipline highlights the pervasiveness of plastics and microplastics from the deepest abyssal environment to the most remote oceanic islands and the extreme pressure being exerted on the planet and some got up very early or stayed up very late. May they be thanked here. Thank you all. So I encourage you to keep in touch and continue sharing your thoughts. Uh, thank you UNDK team and thank you Sophie and Clara for the technical and digital work. It was a sincere honor for me to have moderated this round table with so many magnificent people involved in this common and global struggle. I look forward to meeting you in the coming month, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you also Thank you. to our virtual audience. Sorry Thank we you. couldn't take more questions from our side. 
So have a good morning, uh, afternoon, evening or night, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you.